Hello, I'm Diana Reich, the Artistic Director of the Charleston Literary Festival based in South Carolina, USA. I would like to welcome you from wherever in the world that you may be watching. If the past fraught 18 months has taught us anything, it has taught us that books and their authors, whether classical or contemporary, really matter. In trying times, readers turn to books for insights into the human condition, for the opportunity to be transported to other worlds, for ideas, for arguments, for inspiration, for experiencing the impossible, for laughter and for the release of tears. The festival will provide the opportunity to engage with a galaxy of literary and artistic stars, as well as up and coming writers who are making waves. We have a far flung cast list featuring authors from all over the United States, as well as the United Kingdom and elsewhere. Whether they're talking about former literary trailblazers or gene editing or human rights or popular culture or feminism or medieval nuns or innumerable other subjects, they have one thing in common, the ability of compelling stories to linger in our imaginations. We're grateful to all our speakers, whether virtual or in-person for sharing their talents. Please thank them by purchasing their books. The festival couldn't happen without a committed team and board. We would like to thank our donors, both private and public, who generously make the festival possible. The College of Charleston, our academic partner, has been an invaluable source of support. It's no accident that the festival takes place in Charleston, a prime destination with a progressive literary and artistic tradition. Please come and see for yourselves, but make sure to visit during the Charleston Literary Festival, which takes place during the first half of November each year. Meanwhile, I hope that you enjoy the 2021 Charleston Literary Festival and that it makes you think and dream afresh. It's my pleasure now to introduce Philippe Sands and a little bit later when I think he'll be able to join us, Nicholas Frank, as well as their interlocutor, Richard Wolfe. Philip Sands is Professor of Law at University College London, a practicing barrister and the author of the award-winning East West Street. As an international human rights lawyer, he's been involved in many high profile cases, such as Pinochet, Yugoslavia, Guantanamo and the Rohingya. He is the president of English Pen and a frequent commentator on CNN and BBC World Service. Nicholas Frank is a German author and journalist, best known for a book denunciating his father, Hans Frank, the lawyer who became Governor General of Poland during World War II. The book, serialized in the German weekly Stern in the late 1980s, was extremely controversial. It has recently been republished in an English version. Richard Wolff is an author and journalist. He is co-author of The Victim's Fortune, about the compensation paid to Nazi victims, and the author of the more recent book on, Obama, on Obama's campaign called Renegade, The Making of a President. I'm now going to hand over to Philippe Sands. Thank you very much, uh, Diana, for your generous introduction and hello to um, the Charleston Literary Festival and very lovely to be with you, Richard. For those who are signed in, just so you're aware, we've been having a little bit of a technical difficulty connecting to Germany um, and Nicholas Frank is on the line and hoping to join us uh, very shortly. So in the meantime, I thought what I'd very briefly do is just mention how I first came across Nicholas, because I think that is the introduction to why he's with us this evening. Back in 2010, I started researching what became my book East West Street, which told the story of my grandfather and Leon Buchholz and two men, Hirsch Lauterpacht and Raphael Lemkin, who would invent respectively the concepts of crimes against humanity and genocide, the crime of killing individuals in large numbers and genocide, the destruction of groups. So I carried on with my research. I came across a fourth man. His name was Hans Frank. Hans Frank was a lawyer. He was actually Adolf Hitler's personal lawyer from 1928 to 1933. And he was compensated for his fine service to the National Socialists in that period, initially 
with the appointment of uh, Minister of Justice in Bavaria. And then from 1939 until 1945, the uh, Governor General of Nazi-occupied Poland. He was apprehended in May 45, and he was one of the seven, uh, one of the main defendants, and defendant number seven, in the famous mm. Nuremberg trial, the one with Hermann Goering and others that you know and have seen. And he was convicted of crimes against humanity and war crimes and hanged, uh, sentenced to death and hanged on the 16th of October, 1946. He became the glue, if you like, on my story. He was the connector between my grandfather who lost his entire family, Lauterpacht and Lemkin who lost their entire families. Lauterpacht and Lemkin actually prosecuted Hans Frank and when the trial opened, they did not know that the man they were prosecuting was responsible for the deaths of their entire families, parents, cousins, nephews, nieces, uncles, aunts, and so on and so forth. So I became interested in Hans Frank. And like when I prepare a case before international court or trial, I research intently. I, with my research assistants, look for everything literally that has ever been written about Hans Frank. And there were a multitude of articles and books and notes and other items. And amongst them, one stuck out. It was a book that was published in English in 1981 by Nicholas Frank, one of the five children of Hans Frank. Uh, it was called in German Der Vater, but had been translated into English as in Shadow of the Reich. The latest uh, edition, which is just out this year, in fact, is called The Father. It was an extraordinary book, a gripping book. Um, it went into great detail, a son's view of his father. Uh, and I determined that I really needed to meet Nicholas Frank, who I learned was a very distinguished author, uh, as Diana said, with Stern. I eventually tracked him down. It took a little bit of time. And we met for the first time at the end of 2011. I was trepidatious because, after all, it was a man whose father had been responsible for the extermination of my grandfather's entire family. And I found a remarkable individual, intelligent, warm, funny, and utterly straightforward about what his father had done. He despises his father. The very first thing that Nicholas Frank said to me when I met him now 10 years ago, exactly 10 years ago, was this. Philippe, you have to understand that I am against the death penalty in all cases, except in the case of my father. And the next thing he did was to put his hand into his jacket pocket, take out a photograph and show me the picture of his father hanged at Nuremberg. It was a shocking moment. I asked him why he did that. And he said, Philippe, every day, I need to remind myself that my father is well and truly dead. So there you are by way of introduction uh, to Nicholas Frank and to his father, Hans Frank. We have become close friends over the last 10 years and have done a number of projects together. Uh, Richard, I hope that gives you a, a yes. general context. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you for that. And we sincerely hope that Nicholas can join us. Uh, a few technical difficulties, as Philippe said. Uh, Philippe, um, uh, while we wait for Nicholas to join, um, uh, I would like to talk about your extraordinary book, The Rat Line, uh, which I think is something of a sort of historical detective book, but it really centers on on some other characters uh, who uh, obviously uh, engage with Hans Frank and the story in Poland. But in many ways, the central figure of The Rat Line, uh, Horst Wächter, the son of the governor of Galicia, who worked for Hans Frank. But Horst Vector is the polar opposite of Nicholas, who we're waiting to hear from. So can you maybe just start out by explaining who Horst is, what his father did, and the contrast between Nicholas and Horst? Sure. So I think it was in our second get together that uh, Nicholas Frank said to me, Philippe, you're interested in Lemberg. Lemberg is a remarkable city today in Ukraine called Lviv. It used to be called Lvov when it was part of Poland and Lemberg when it was part of the Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire and also occupied by Germany. And Nick said, since you're so interested in Lemberg, Lviv, Lvov, would you like to meet the son of the governor, the man who is responsible for the extermination of your grandfather's family and Lauterpacht and Lemkin's family? I said, sure, not sure why he'd want to meet me, but let's give it a go. And Nicholas duly introduced me to Horst Wächter, the son of Otto 
and Charlotte Vechter. Uh, we went down together to meet him in Vienna. And as you say, Richard, he's very different from Nicholas. I wouldn't say he's the polar opposite in this sense. He's not a Holocaust denier. He's not an anti-Semite. He's not a racist. But he believes that it is his duty as the loving son of a mother he adored to find the good in his own father. And that is what he has devoted the last 15 years to doing. And so you have, with these two sons, a couple of remarkable characters, both the sons of absolutely top table Nazis. I mean, people who met and corresponded with and knew Adolf Hitler personally. Um, uh, but the two sons have, and, and the fathers did the same things, essentially. Both were involved in mass murder on an industrial scale. Uh, but they take the two sons a very different perspective to their fathers. And I was fascinated by that. How could it be that there is such a different direction taken? And uh, I, one thing led to another. I wrote a piece for the Financial Times magazine back in 2013, uh, which was entitled My Father, the Good Nazi, a profile of Horst, in which Nick also makes an appearance. And that was then made into a BBC documentary by David Evans, who's also a director of Downton Abbey. And that got a very large viewership. And it was on my relationship with Nicholas and Horst. In the course of filming, we went to Ukraine and met some of the people who loved, still today, Otto Wächter. And Nicholas was appalled, uh, described Horst as a new Nazi, a view which he's since retracted. Horst was very upset. And Horst said, how can I prove that I'm not a Nazi? As a litigator, I know that proving a negative is always a difficult thing. Um, and in the end, I suggested to Horst that the remarkable family archive that was his in, his, in his possession, 10,000 pages of letters, diaries, notebooks, photographs, movies, audio recordings, he should make those available to a museum. He gave it to the US Holocaust Museum in Washington and asked me if I wanted a copy. And that remarkable archive became the basis for the book, The Rat Line. Um, Philippe, the, um, I think many people listening today uh, and watching us will, um, the, the idea of a good Nazi may bring them up short uh, because of course, everything around this period has become uh, the touchstone for definitions of good and evil, right and wrong. Um, what's amazing about your book is how banal, mundane, domestic the story is between uh, uh, amid the the Vector family and Otto's career so can you just talk a little bit for people who haven't read the book and should go out and buy a copy um explain the sort of the story of the family and Otto Charlotte's relationship and obviously their son Horst yeah well I mean how long have you got Richard I'll keep it I'll keep it short I mean they're a yeah. remarkable couple and what I was fascinated about, you know, we know we know the stories, the headlines in the newspapers that describe the Nazi monsters. But in fact, as with everything in life, it's much more complex. Um, I never describe Otto or Charlotte as monsters, although Otto in particular, supported by his loving, ghastly wife, uh, was absolutely complicit in everything he did. Why not? Because... They did ghastly things, they did monstrous things, but they were also capable of decency, humanity, love, generosity. And this was the issue and continues to be the issue in the work that I do with cases of you know, mass atrocity. How is it that someone who is educated, cultured, intelligent, smart, appears decent, can get involved in mass murder on an industrial scale? This is a mystery to me. And what I wanted to get to the heart of was the connection between this couple to grapple with the real lives that they led. Otto going off during the day, building the Krakow ghetto, executing killers of Germans, running the transports for concentration camps and extermination camps. And then in the evening, going to a Brahms concert going out for a wonderful meal with his wife, looking after the children. It's this disconnect that I think is so complex and evidently for many people so fascinating. 
And I, I think the answer to the question, how can they do it, is always the same, whether you're dealing with the Yazidis, the Rohingya, the Uyghurs, the Nazis, whatever it may be, it's othering. It's that the targets of your disdain are not treated as humans like I am. And so it becomes easier to get involved in these horrors, but it's extremely disconcerting. Yes, I, it's extraordinary that the, uh, uh, the everyday extermination that he was engaged in doesn't even, uh, isn't worth a mention in, in his copious letters. Um, uh, briefly. Uh, well, 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 he does, I mean, this is the thing that's interesting. So I, so I had 10,000 pages to go through. It took four years with four wonderful researchers. Everything was in German. Much of it was handwritten and they have appalling handwriting. Um, so it took a very long time. I think the material may have been partly filleted so mm -hmm. that some of the real horrors were removed. But there would be, you know, little details, a letter from December 1939. My darling Humschen, my gorgeous, lovely wife, um, marvellous day in Krakow. The Vienna Philharmonic has been lots of important politicians have been. I'm being treated with great respect. Wonderful times for me. A little bit of local difficulty. Tomorrow I have to have 50 poles shot. Similarly, three years later, on the extermination of the Jewish population of Lviv, a complaint that with all the, Ju with all the Jews um, deported, there's no one to put powder on the tennis court anymore. It, it's, it's this kind of point of detail that I think is so arresting and so horrifying. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I remember doing research for my book, talking to uh, uh, the representative of, of, of the French Jewish community who, uh, who survived the war. And he told me about how the war was just a sort of everyday thing. You'd be walking along with a baguette in your hand, a normal day, and then a bomb would go off or there'd be a partisan attack and a retribution in the court. And then you go back to carrying your baguette down the street. Um, uh, we should explain a little bit about what the rat line is, uh, this this escape route, mm -hmm. and and maybe you could also explain um, why it fails, what happens to uh, this, the away so, book. So I've known Horst for 10 years. For the first five years, I would say the central focus of my interest was what his mum and dad did during the war. And what his mum and dad during the war was extremely nasty. Unlike Hans Frank, who was caught, Otto Wechter disappeared off the face of the earth on the 9th of May, 1945, literally without trace. He reappeared four years later, dead in a hospital in Rome run by the Vatican. And I became totally fascinated with the materials that Horst shared with me because it provided a detailed account of what his father and mother had done between 45 and 49. And in particular, how his father had escaped. His father was indicted by mass, for mass murder. He was being chased by the Americans, the Soviets, the Poles, the Jews, the British, and many others. But he disappeared into thin air. It turned out that he was hiding not so far from home, near Salzburg, as LM say, uh, in the Austrian mountains. And every two weeks, Charlotte would go and um, visit him. Uh, she would bring provisions. She would bring newspapers. She would bring clothing. They were living in very difficult conditions. And he was with a companion. He had, he had met up with a young Waffen-SS soldier called Buko Hatman. And when I first encountered this name, Buko Hatman, in 2016, I said to Horst Wächter, tell me about this Buko Hatman, young SS guy. Who was he? Why was he motivated to do what he did? Um, lots of questions. Horst looked at me. He's a sweet and gentle soul and he said well Philippe I can I can answer all of your questions about Buko Hatman pause or we can telephone him so this was pretty extraordinary this was 2016 71 years after Fechter and Ratman were hiding for three years together in the Austrian mountains uh, I it had never occurred to me that he might still be alive but he was and I went to meet him. It was one of the more extraordinary meetings I've ever had. I spent a full day with him. It's the only interview he ever gave. And in the course of that interview, he described what Wächter had done. He had descended from the mountain in the summer of 48 and was going to make his way to Rome. Uh, and from Rome, he was then going to make his way on what was called the Reich 
migratory route, the path from Italy to South America and freedom. He never made it because he died in mysterious circumstances, but the materials that Horse gave me had lots of material on the way in which Otto Wächter sought to escape, his networks, his contacts. It was all anonymized, and it's why it took so long to decipher it. But eventually, we uncovered an extraordinary story. Most extraordinary, I would say, because it turned out that the Americans who were chasing Otto Wächter, the counterintelligence corps run by a rather remarkable individual called Thomas Lucid, who would go on to be very senior in the CIA, um, knew all about Otto Wächter and all about the rat line. Indeed, they were using the rat line as a recruitment tool. And I was so perplexed by what I discovered, um, in particular something called Project Los Angeles, in which the Americans were basically recruiting senior Nazis, senior fascists, and senior people in the Vatican to spy on the dreaded Soviets, that I went to my neighbor, the writer John McCarry, who's sadly no longer with us, to ask him questions about the Cold War, the Nazis, espionage, the rat line. And he told me a remarkable story that he was there in 1949. He was a young British soldier. Uh, his job was to interrogate Germans in prisoner of war camps. And I said, what, to prosecute the mass murderers? He said, no, to recruit them. And this is, I think, one of the really big untold stories that raises a lot of moral questions about the way the West, as Le Carre put it, turned on a sixpence and started recruiting the people who had been told, he had been told, were the worst of the worst. Yes, that's an extraordinary turn in the book. Um, uh, and, and I don't want to gloss over it, but in the interest of time, I, I think it might be worth also explaining the involvement of the Catholic Church as well. Um, they weren't recruiting spies so much, even if some of them were involved in espionage. Yeah. Well, well, very, why, why did the Catholic Church help Otto Wächter in particular? Well, I'm very careful how I talk about this because there's a lot of unknowns. Um, Wächter was assisted in particular by a very senior Austrian bishop called Alois Hudal, who had also helped others, Mengele, Priebke, Barbie, very famous names, uh, and was really one of the main people on running the rat line. But remarkably, Hudal was also a spy for the Americans. He was paid $50 in cash every month for five years. Uh, that really surprised me. Hugh, the, the question that I think is of great significance is, was Hudal a lone operator or was he doing this with support of his old friend, Cardinal Pacelli, a.k.a. Pope Pius XII? They had been very close in the 1930s. They became more distant in the 1940s. Um, there is some evidence that Pius XII provided a little bit of financial support for helping German refugees in difficulty. Whether he did so with knowledge of what was being done to them, spirited out to South America, is another question entirely. And that, I think, is still to be researched probably by people like David Kurtzer, who helped me a lot uh, with my book. So... There was certainly some Vatican senior official involvement, but whether the Vatican Church as a whole was involved, I don't know. And as with so many of these kinds of issues still today, things are never only quite what they seem. Nothing is ever black and white. Um, a good amount of Horst's presence in the book, apart from obviously being the source of this amazing trove of, of documents, <laughs> But a good amount of his presence in the book, and I, 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 it sounds, it feels as if this is partly prompted by audience reactions to maybe the Financial Times piece or, or the documentary, but his presence is, hinges on this idea of his judgment. Can he accept that his father did evil things? And, and I wonder, I wondered repeatedly through the course of this book, why we should care? Why, why are we so interested in having the son acknowledge the sins of the father when we know the father is evil. There's no dispute over what he did or, I mean, may, maybe the son wants to mitigate it somehow, but the, the facts seem clear. So 
why do we care? Why do we care about what the next generation thinks? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm suddenly realizing, as you put that question to me, Richard, that the really, the most important answer to that question is because it matters today more than ever. Where in the face of incontrovertible evidence of nefarious, negative, terrible behavior by certain people, many people nevertheless cling to the view that the human being concerned is decent, worthy, sensible. I'm not going to draw a direct parallel uh, between Otto Wächter and an immediate former president of the United States, but a lot of us are wondering how could it be that in the face of, for example, the 6th of January, so many people don't want to see what happened and the role of that individual. And that, for me, is fascinating. It's the suspension of disbelief. Horst will say to me, yes, my father was involved. Yes, he was a senior Nazi. Yes, he was an SS Brigade Führer. But he was part of the system. He didn't actually believe in doing wrongdoing himself. He got caught up in things that were bigger than him, and he was essentially a decent person with good values. And the the fascination is not whether that view is correct or not, because it's not. The fascination for me is how a reasonable, intelligent person can allow themselves to be, if you like, taken into that situation. And so what I am fascinated by is what is it that makes Horst adopt that position? As Nicholas Frank often says, most of the people who are descendants of senior top-ranking Nazis follow Horst's path rather than Nicholas's path. Mm -hmm. In other words, there seems to be a human sort of disposition to avoid confronting realities that are unpalatable. And I think the answer to your question is that that is an easier way of getting through the day. You, you don't have to confront your own errors of judgment. You don't have to confront the, the negative acts of those closely around you who for some reason or other you feel positive towards or you love. And Horst has constructed a world for himself which focuses only on the positives and simply cuts out all of the negatives. And I think the way that happens psychologically, psychoanalytically, is relevant today. Um, another question before maybe we can take some questions. Uh, uh, I, um, for, uh, when I was doing the research of my book, I actually met Simon Wiesenthal in, in Vienna <laughs> and um, was fascinated by his experiences um, and, uh, and especially what Vienna was like after the war in the immediate aftermath, which is obviously features heavily in your, in your book. And he told me that Vienna after the war was full of Nazis. In fact, he said it was impossible to go into a bar or a hotel without seeing the place full of the people he was allegedly trying to hunt at the time. He didn't have to hunt very far. And I, I was shocked. I didn't think people were that brazen about it. And he said, no, they weren't brazen about it. He said, I, they would tell me to my face that uh, they should have killed me when they had the chance. And so I, my question for you is, how many Otto Wechters were there? How, was, was he a special case? Or, or is it the, the twist of his story that makes it special? Um, was Europe full of them? Well, I think, I mean, I mean, Wächter was uniquely high. He really was. He was he was immediately below Heinrich Himmler in terms of the SS hierarchy. So he was an absolute top notch Nazi. But if your question is how many people who were deeply involved, perhaps at lower levels, were simply spirited away into society and became regular folk, the answer is a huge number. Um, that we do know. That, of course, is what caused in Germany in the 1960s so much trauma because, uh, you know, all of a sudden, and I know this from lawyers that I work with who are a little older than me, who were at law school in the 60s, late 60s, they suddenly realized that their teachers, their professors, their university colleagues had been senior Nazis and they had been deeply involved in really nefarious things. And 
thus begun the Red Army faction in, in Germany. So there was not a full cleaning up after 1945. A lot of people disappeared into the ether. And a lot of people would say it's not just then that there were Nazi types in Austria and Vienna, but still today. And that um, is one of the things that I think is so challenging for us. When you come into an event like that, um, what is to be done afterwards? And Germany and Austria have taken different paths. One of the questions I'm often asked is what are the essential differences between Nicholas and Horst? Well, one of the essential differences, of course, is that Nicholas is German and Horst is Austrian. And Germany, I think it's fair to say, has engaged with that Nazi period far more directly and brutally than Austria. Austria, after 1955, was recognized by an international treaty as the first victim of Nazism. And that created a space which ran for 30, 40 years in which many Austrians could present themselves as victims. And so there was very little teaching and very little engagement. Um, but, but the question you pose is a very important one. Um, and it goes to the question of what is to be done when such horrors occur and uh, reasonable people can disagree. We've seen in Iraq, you know, the catastrophe of uh, trying to root out every single person who was involved with the Ba'ath movement of President Saddam Hussein. You end up creating a vacuum of power in which other negative things happen. So this is a very real challenge. Yeah. Uh, when, when you get a disastrously awful regime, how do you transition into something that's more decent? And it seems we're still having some technical problems uh, uh, connecting with Nicholas. I do encourage everyone listening to actually read his book, uh, The Father. Yeah. It's extraordinary today reading it so raw. It's so, um, it's shocking. It's, um, but also one of the uh, extraordinary things about the book is, is how he seems to be pushing back against the popular reaction when people understand who his father was. He talks about being a hitchhiker and all of these people picking up in the car tell him what a wonderful man his father was. So, so yes, there's a reckoning that's happened in Germany. Uh, and we certainly see that uh, at least on the Austrian side through Horst's uh, family, through his children. But that reckoning maybe isn't quite as extensive as we would like to think it is. Um, so go out and read The Father for sure. Um, there was a question that briefly popped up about uh, talking about Otto Wächter's uh, escape. Um, if the if his wife could visit him so much and deliver all sorts of supplies to him, uh, how hard was it for other people to find him? Well, Otto Wächter hid about 40 kilometers from Salzburg in mountains above 2000 meters. So he was living in very stark and difficult conditions with Buko Hatman. And every two weeks, they would have he and Charlotte a secret rendezvous location, always in a different place. And she would toddle off for a couple of days at very great personal um, challenge, I would say. I mean, it, you know, it is also a love story. And this is what is problematic. Uh, she wasn't just monstrously supportive of her appalling husband but she loved him and she displayed her love in ways that are at times rather compelling um, and she did it not quite in plain sight they worried they were being followed they worried she was being watched she took a lot of precautions the correspondence they wrote was always anonymized in terms of any people who were mentioned um, but she pulled it off for three and a half years I think that it's certain that Otto Wächter was helped by a large number of people in the local vicinity. In fact, interestingly, the book has just come out in Germany and Austria a few months ago. This is the rat line, my book. And I've had two very interesting uh, sort of bookshop requests from those communities mm. in the area where he hid. And I'm going in early January to do two bookshop events in Hartstadt and Fieberbrunn in Austria, near to where Wächter hid. Um, and the reaction in those communities to the book is very telling. Half the people say, oh my God, we knew nothing about this. We must get this fellow Sands to come and talk to us about it. 
And the other half say, no, 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 best kept in silence. We've kept it under wraps for the last 70 years. Let's say nothing about it. So I've accepted it's going to go ahead. And I'm going to meet, I suspect, some pretty interesting characters because there will be descendants of people who will have helped Wächter uh, and Hartmann on their uh, escape routes. So it seems extraordinary that they were able to survive for so long. Um, and it raises the question of how much those who were tracking them, the British, the Americans, the Soviets, actually knew. Um, and I suspect they probably knew a little bit more than even I've been able to find out. But I have found out that they certainly knew something. I mean, I found out, for example, that when Otto Wächter arrived in Rome on the afternoon of the 29th of April 1949, he was greeted by a man he referred to in his letter home to Charlotte as the religious gentleman. We were able to work out who the religious gentleman was. It was Alois Hudal. We were able to work out that Hudal was working as a spy for the Americans. And we found the document eventually, it took a long time, through a wonderful professor in Florida, Norman Goda, to work out that within one hour of Wächter's arrival in Rome, Hudal had informed the US Army, the counterintelligence corps, of Wächter's presence uh, in uh, Rome. And the CIC did nothing. It seems instead they developed arrangements to be able to recruit him, as Le Carre said, to be able to get hold of his Rolodex. So these are really complex, uh, really yeah. complex stories. Just in the last couple of minutes we've got, you, you talk about this as a love story, um, uh, and, and it appears to be so, even if Otto himself wasn't entirely faithful to his wife. Um, there seems also to be a story about personal enrichment and ambition, um, careerism. Uh, I wonder if you could sort of get your arms around how ideological this couple were. Did they do all of this because they, they believed in the cause or was it something more mundane about their own relationship and, and careerism? Total believers in the cause. Not, he was a Nazi from 1921. He was absolutely in at the outset uh, and remained a Nazi for the rest of his life. He was involved in 1934 in the plot to overthrow the Dolphus uh, chancellorship. And in fact, Dolphus was killed and Wächter had to flee to Berlin. Um, and you get it in the correspondence. This is where the correspondence becomes so interesting. My my, my greatest helper on a lot of this was a wonderful historian called Lisa Jardine, who sadly is no longer with us, and who is an expert on private archival material. She has a thesis, which is that it is from the private material that you really um, learn and work out um, the greater truths. And, and you do. So there is the letter, for example, from the spring of 1945. Otto is in... Lemberg, Lviv, he's about to head off to Krakow and Warsaw to avoid confronting the Red Army too soon. They're about to take over Lviv. And there's an exchange of correspondence with Charlotte. And Charlotte writes to him and says, you know, my darling, I've had a really brilliant idea. Let's team up with the British. The British are even more nationalistic than the Germans. And I think they can help us confront the Soviets, the Red Army. They hate communism and Bolshevism. And then she pauses in the letter and then says, no, of course not. We're never going to be able to do that. Why not, she says, or writes, because of the Jews. They're always spoiling everything, always contaminating everything. They're always going to screw everything up for us and prevent us from doing the necessary. So right at the end, you've got this expression between the two of them of, sort of abject anti-Semitism. Well, one of the things that I looked for, you know, in 10,000 pages of documents, is there any hint of regret that they went too far? They didn't get it right. They, not a single thing, quite the contrary. When Otto Wächter's father, General Joseph Wächter, asks him to intercede to help a Jewish child caught in the Krakow ghetto under his administration, Otto Wächter refuses and writes back to his father and says, no, nothing to be done. The race rules protect us from these people. So these were 
true believers. It wasn't just up the greasy pole stuff. It wasn't only ambition and power, although that played a role. It was a deep ideological belief and a deep anti-Semitism. I believe we're still trying to bring Nicholas into the uh, into this conversation. So uh, maybe we can just uh, carry on for a couple more minutes. Um, uh, you mentioned briefly about the relevance now. Um, uh, there is a rise across much of the world around authoritarianism, but there's also a rise specifically in Germany with the AFD and the neo-Nazis. So um, your assessment of the situation now uh, across Europe, uh, let's sort of may perhaps leave the American situation to one side, um, but we don't have to. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it, it is, is history increasingly forgotten um, because this whole generation is is passing away. Yes, absolutely. Um, we are about to lose the generation that knew firsthand what happened, who experienced what happened. You know, I just made a BBC Radio 4 uh, hour-long programme or 40-minute programme on the, the legacy of Nuremberg, and I interviewed three people who were there in courtroom 600. Ben Ferentz, age 101, Robbie Dundas, age 95, Eve Begbeder, age 96. And it's extraordinary to speak to people who were there who can tell you the evidence they saw, the defendants they questioned, what it was like. And with the loss of that generation, that remarkable generation, I think we're losing the power of first-hand experience. And I worry about that. I'm going to take the little perch you offered me because I don't actually think that in the next 30 years, Europe is necessarily going to be the main problem. I'm beginning to think that the United States may well be the main problem. There is something brewing in the United States. It's not the same as what happened in Germany in the 1930s, but there are points of connection that are deeply worrisome. Uh, and I'd say the same actually about the United Kingdom. The two countries that gave us Nuremberg, that gave us the idea of multilateral rules and human rights for all individuals, have now effectively walked away from their commitments to that. I mean, we may have a temporary moment under the Biden administration where there's a re-engagement, but Boris Johnson and Donald Trump share a belief in favor of bilateralism, against multilateralism, against rules, there is contempt for lawyers, there is contempt for judges, there is contempt for courts, all of the things that motivated that 1945 moment are under attack in, in those two countries. And that worries me very greatly indeed. Uh, I believe we're working on bringing Nicholas back. Uh, I don't mean to uh be entertained by the prospect of uh, of what you said, but um, I think Donald Trump likes lawyers if, if they are doing his entire bidding and aren't actually uh, uh, yet disbarred, but soon will be. Um, uh, another question for you uh, about the the sort of moral murkiness of of what you portray. Um, are people ready? For for that discussion in the sense of judgment around the Holocaust has become so clear that, you know, is anyone really going to say, well, yes, they were, we can see the nuance of these characters. What purpose do you think there is in exploring that moral nuance? I think the purpose is very straightforward. I think that many people are capable of doing dreadful things. Some will never do dreadful things. And the question is... Well, now, that's Nicholas Frank, a speaker, ah, but it's next. Wonderful. Which, oh, I can't see myself, but if they see me, it's quite okay. We can hear you, Nicholas. Can you hear us? Yes, for sure. Since hours, I can hear you. <laughs> Welcome, Richard. I'm going to put it over to you as to how you want to handle the time yes. that we have. Well, uh, I'm not sure what time we have, but while we have Nicholas, I would just like to say uh, again, encourage the audience to to read his extraordinary book, uh, The Father. Um, Nicholas, briefly, um, 
uh, if you can. Why briefly? <laughs> um, first of all, looking back, you wrote the book some time ago, The Father. Uh, how do you feel about the book today as opposed to when you wrote it? Uh, it's just the same. Uh, the only thing uh, which is uh, which had uh, changed is in my book I write on one sentence that I hate my father. Uh, this has changed to I really despise him. That, that sounds like a mild softening, but it, 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 maybe it isn't. Fun, it sounds. It sounds like you've softened a little, but maybe you haven't at all. Since I couldn't understand something with uh, with the line is not quite properly. Well, let me let me uh, extend that a bit further. When why did you write the book when you did? Was there something about the time in the nineteen eighties that made you feel like you had to say this in this book? Yes, uh, the thing was that first thing my only philosophical idea was don't let your father ruin your personal life and the other thing was the silence in Germany which was still going on through all the decades uh, when I was an adult already and this made me more and more furious what do you think situation is today then in terms of silence or, or attitude or history. There's something wrong with the line. Unfortunately, I think I go to my uh, mobile phone. Maybe it's better then. Could you please repeat it slowly with uh, something yeah. dark voice the, behind it? The situation in Germany today compared to when you wrote the book, can you compare the two? <clears throat> the anti-Semitism is now stronger than before. It's uh, anti-Semitism has survived uh, also the so-called defeat of Germany after the Second World War. I used to tell it it was a liberation. And this, this kind of uh, ideology thinking uh, has survived till nowadays. Nicholas, uh, tell us how you introduced him to Horst Wächter, uh, obviously uh, one of the central figures in the rat line. Uh, tell us what you think of Horst today. Uh, <coughs> I thought because it's the same, uh, um, he was born also in 1939, and I thought that he has the same opinion about our fathers like I have to my father. And uh, when Philip made this uh, movie with us, I found out that he is completely the opposite side to me. And uh, then I finished my friendship to him. Do you think there are, there are or were many people like us in their attitudes towards their fathers? Oh, for sure. The, the great majority is the same opinion like Horst. Uh, as you know, it's a big taboo. Uh, you have to honor your parents, whatever they left to you. And therefore, I broke this taboo, and that's always something special. People in Germany would say, why have you done this? Uh, and it was a wild time. You didn't understand what happened then, and so on. Uh, so that, and Horst is defending him, uh, like everybody in the majority of the Germans and the Austrians, I would say. And over the, uh, as you've watched Philip unfold the stories, um, can you uh, explain to me how that had the experience for you? You wrote your book in the 80s. Philip's books obviously are, are more recent. But what has it been like seeing stories unfold being discovered? Uh, through <coughs> and, and movies and podcasts. Uh, re researching my father was that I not only found out uh, his cowardice, but only also my own one. 
And so it was for me, for my character, I would say, really good uh, to see what a coward my father was and what a coward I myself am. And this was very, uh, very good experience for me. Maybe you can explain a little bit more about being a coward. Why do you say that? Your book is unflinching. Your book seems courageous even today. So what, what was, why do you say you're a coward? Uh, the typical way of uh, knowing a lot and doing nothing. Like now, the problem in Europe, or especially also in Germany, with the refugees from all the countries uh, in the Near East and the Far East. So we know, like the Germans knew after the Nazis took over power in 1933, they all know something has happened with the Jews, with their neighbors. And nowadays the Germans know exactly that the refugees who made it to Europe are in really awful condition. And everybody knows it, but nobody does anything against it. And so this is one of the bigger causes where I'm also involved. I haven't done anything in favor of the refugees. I am writing my books and I'm <laughs> struggling with all kinds of people around, but I haven't done anything till now in favor of the refugees. Yes, I, we, we are sadly have to um, uh, end things very shortly. And thank you for struggling with thank the technology. You. <laughs> I just want to ask Philippe if he has a final word for the audience or for Nicola uh, and about the books in particular. Well, I'm very pleased to be with you, Richard. And I'm glad we finally heard uh, from Nicholas. But I really would urge those who are watching to take a look at Nicholas's book. This is a writer and a human being of extraordinary courage who has taken on the horrors of the past and addressed them very fully and very brutally. Uh, and I owe Nicholas Frank a very big debt. He introduced me to another way of looking at things. He has helped me all along my journey, and I am deeply uh, grateful for that. Um, the beating heart of my work is laid, the foundations are laid by the work that Nicholas has done, and I want to publicly acknowledge that. Can you see my red ears? <laughs> I can see them burning bright, Nicholas Frank. <laughs> so thank you very much, Philip. And I'm sorry with God I'm not a technician. Well, that's perfectly right. Thank you uh, again for your patience and struggling through the technology to Nicholas Frank. And uh, thank you for sharing this extraordinary book, Philippe Sands, The Rat Line. I urge you again, I echo again, read Nicholas's book, The Father. Uh, thank but you the, all. But the British version, not the American one, because the American version is purified. <laughs> don't believe we can purify these stories at all. Or, uh, <laughs> so thank you again. Thank you to uh, Charleston Literary Festival for having us. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and thank you for bearing with us today. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.